Keegan and Company is not a licensed mental health service and should not be a substitute for professional help. In these conversations, we touch on a variety of mental health issues and the advice given is general in nature. So if you are struggling, please seek professional advice or call Lifeline on 13 11 14. Enjoy the episode. Keegan and Company, it's Keegan and Company, the company in Key. That's it, that's gotta be it. Welcome back to the Keegan and Company podcast. Before we kick things off, I do have a small favor to ask. If you could please subscribe and follow whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on, whether that being Apple, Spotify, or YouTube, uh, it's a great way to help us grow the audience and build the podcast, um, and I would really appreciate it. Now, to get stuck into it, uh, I am having a conversation with former teammate, good friend, current NRL and player for the Parramatta Eels, Sean Lane. How are you, brother? Good, bro. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Mate, I am... I wanted to kick things off. How's the last week and a half been? Just for context, for everyone who's listening, we're probably a week, couple of weeks post-season. Mm. Uh, we had our awards night. We had your awards night probably about a week ago. How's it all feeling? How, how are you feeling? I think um, comparatively to this time last year, uh, pretty pretty depressing. <laughs> um, last year, we're coming off a... Uh, well, this time last year, we're still obviously going, you know. I think we finished in the top four getting ready to go up against Penrith in our major semi. Um, yeah, it was a great season for us last year. I, I think I was went to the Dally M's. We had a bunch of us there. Uh, we made the GF, had our awards night, and then we'll party in for like another week and a half or something. But this year, it's a, a lot different. Um, we haven't been out of finals footy for five years now, I think, and um, just such a different feeling. It's definitely not one that I want to um experience again so the to answer your question the last week and a half pretty down we we tried to go out and and celebrate our season but when the result doesn't go your way in professional sport it's very difficult everyone's everyone's mood is definitely um a lot lower than um yeah what what is uh standard that was that was the feel at the awards night hey like even just even just walking in last week like crew were down no Mm. one was really having a drink to be honest like i know you guys had did the did the event the next day but even like everyone who got up and spoke and got an award like guthy won you know player of the year and pretty Mm. much was like yeah it's disappointing like it was disappointing that was the general thing i was like Mm. for me i don't know like i I've, I've obviously like been a part of the Parramatta Eels. Like I love what you guys did last year with the grand final, and yeah, it is disappointing. But can you take like any any <coughs> positives from it? The way that I kind of approach life or any sort of adversity that that I face is you, you got to try and take some positive from yeah. it. Otherwise, you're just going to be sitting around and have this pessimistic worldview, you know. So, um, for myself personally, I've had plenty of challenges this year you know the the team results hasn't been the only one um so I guess I've got plenty of practice in throughout this this season of trying to um reframe thing in, things in a positive way and looking at um negative events as an opportunity to grow not just um by the results that they provide to you in the immediate uh, in the immediate time so in my reflection of this this year and the results that we've had as a team, the way I see it is it's a result for us to sit back and reflect on um, a not so successful season, but as an opportunity for us to learn and grow as a group and um, I guess improve the environment that we provide for um, other younger players and uh, the culture that we um, develop as a team moving forward to be more successful and ensure that that doesn't occur again. Reflecting on the last couple years, Footy's a roller coaster, hey. Oh, like, mate, there's, we I and we spoke about this a couple of days ago when we were on the phone. Even, mate, I swear every time we catch up when we caught up for coffee like a month ago or whatever, it's it's a full <laughs> roller coaster. Like, I look at the twenty twenty one season when we played together, um, semi finals mm. coming in, coming into some good form. Yep. Last year was a standout year for you. Obviously, like grand final mm. player of the year for Parramatta. Yeah. Um, considering to be in the Australian team, which is a huge honour, and personally, mm. I think you should have been there. Mm. And then you look at this year, obviously, didn't make the eight, but then also the string of injuries with the f- yeah. fractured jaw, dislocated elbow, <coughs> hamstrings, mate. It's a bloody roller coaster, hey? Crazy, man. Crazy. It's uh, it's just the game that keeps on giving, mate. The game that keeps on giving. There, There is so many good qualities and amazing experiences that you get with, with rugby league. Um, and I guess people go into every experience of rugby league hoping that that's what they're going to get out of it. 
Um, but it's just not the reality of the, the situation, you know. It, the reality is that those years are only going to be very, very sparse. And it's um, going to be most, most likely more years of you failing or you going through difficult times and wishing that you had, perform- had performed better or other things would have gone your way. So it's just more downs on the roller coaster than there is ups really. <laughs> yeah. But the the overall journey is about not just wins and losses. It's about an overall trajectory of improving as a person and as a player. And when you look at it from a more uh, generalized perspective, then it's that's the way I look at it. Is it's just an amazing journey that not many people get to experience in their life. What do you, what were you thinking when you first came into grade? Like, did you always just think, you know, what we're going to play finals? We're, I'm going to be this. I'm going to be this hungry player. Like, what what did you think it would be like before as a little 17, 18 year old Grom coming oh, through? Man, it's just ever since you're a kid, when you're like five years old, and man, football was my life when I was young. Hey, it was all I ever wanted to do. I, I can remember when I was like in my teenage years and I'd stay at home watching TV all week. The, th- the first things I'd do on, in the mornings was watch The Simpsons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was I was quite fat as, as a kid. Like, <laughs> like if we had the gross my weekends was Yeah, my weekends were spent on the couch. <laughs> I wasn't outside socialising. <laughs> But first thing I'm doing, watching The Simpsons, yeah. Simpsons Marathon every Saturday, Sunday, the best. Yeah. So I know every Simpsons quote, every episode, probably the first 20 seasons. And then I'm watching SmackDown or Raw <laughs> until <laughs> like... very fitting. Yeah, yeah, 12 till 2 o'clock or Crafting something. Crafting your NRL then career. The football, <laughs> then the football's on after that. Yeah. And so I'm watching every game, every weekend. Um, so I, my whole life as, as a kid, I'm sitting around just uh, romanticizing and this idea, having this fantasy about, man, if I could play first grade rugby league, then that would be like a dream come true. My life set after that. Cause that's all you can really, that's all you can really imagine at that point not, in time. You're not looking past that. You're not hey. looking past when you're an adult, when you're beyond when you're 25 or anything like that. But at that point, it's just like too far in the future. So I'm thinking that once I play first grade, my life's made, that's my dream come true. And you're just not even thinking about anything more than that. So by the time you, it starts almost being a, a nearer f- prospect of occurring, by the time you're like 18, 19, you're playing under 20s football, it still kind of feels like it's so out of reach. F- f- that's what it felt like for me. But then in a matter of a few years, it was just like, boom, I was there. Yeah. I'd had my huge growth spurt like we just <laughs> yeah. spoke about. Lost the puppy I was fat. No longer, <laughs> the yeah, I was fat. no longer fat. I was still watching The Simpsons, but... <laughs> <laughs> Smack yeah. down. <laughs> yeah, like kind of trimmed down a little bit, became a bit more athletic. Um, but yeah, it was just an unbelievable experience when I got there. It was a, a dream coming true and everything was just so stimulating and so amazing. I just felt so good about myself because I'd achieved this thing that I just dreamt, dreamt of for 15, 20 years. And so at that point, I just thought like, this is how it's going to feel the rest of my career. Mm. And that's kind of this, like, like I said, this fantasy that you have when you're young and all the way until when you, when you make it even, you're still kind of chasing that fantasy. But as you, as you progress through your career, the fantasy kind of changes a little bit. You realize that like now playing first grade is not enough. I, want, I need to be a consistent first grade player. And then... You become a consistent first grade player and now you're like, oh yeah, but now I need to play rep footy. Mm. And so this whole time you're just caught in this rat race of this like trying to chase these goals further and further just because they're out of your reach and you're trying to improve yourself as a player. But like eventually you realize that's not what's going to make you happy. Mm. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> eventually you realize it's it's about the journey. It's not about the outcomes. That is so summed up. That's summed up so beautifully because we do that in life, hey? Like, mm. we do that with everything. Like, we want the bigger house. We want the faster car. We want everything. more money. We want more status. We want all of that. Yeah. When did mm. you When did you figure that out? Like, when did you be like, it's not about what's next. It's not like if and when. It's like, well, it's part of the journey. Yeah, I think it took several years of me actually chasing and achieving some of these things that I'd set out to achieve. So, like I said, get to first grade yeah mad how good's this then i kind of like got dropped yeah. and i was playing reserve grade for a while and that really took a shot to my confidence 
Because that's the thing that also happens is like when you aspire to achieve certain outcomes, when you don't achieve them, you feel so shit. Mm. It like, it's just destroys your confidence and your self-esteem. So that was me for a few years. Then eventually I realized like, I don't have really anything else out, outside of footy. I, I got to fucking go and work my ass off here to actually get back to playing first grade. Mm. So I did that and finally how good I achieved my goal again. I got back to being a first grader. Let's try and make this a consistent thing. Then I did that. And then it's like, all right, now let's try and be one of the best players on my team. Then I did that. And it's like, let's try and play rep footy. And that was probably around the time when I realized I have this goal of trying to play for New South Wales or rep footy. But there's so many things that were out of my control that it was almost unfair to myself to put that stress onto me because then it was just like every game I was stressing about stats. I was stressing about what big plays I came up with. Um, this is recently. This is like... No, this, this is probably a few years ago. Okay, okay. Let's say this 2019, is, this is not, 2020. This is not, not power when you won player of the year. So I got I got forward of the year in 2019. Okay. Um, so I didn't get player of the year then. But that was probably an eye-opening experience for me. And then the next year, that's when I was really trying to chase rep footy honours. I was like, all right, I, I cemented myself as one of the, as the best forward in Parramatta last year. Let's try and chase rep footy because I know I'm there. I know I'm pretty much at that stage. I need that validation mm. of like myself being that, that caliber of play. I need to chase rep footy. And then once I'm there, I need to stay there. And I had, a, I had another decent year in 2020, but man, New South Wales had like six quality back rowers that were rep footy caliber players. Yeah. And at sometimes it's just things out of your control. Like if a, an incumbent player is still playing well, they're going to retain their position <laughs> and they've got there for a reason because they're bloody good. Yeah. Like they're, they're probably in really good teams too. So they're just going to continue to succeed. And it was like these, these things that were out of my control. I was doing everything I could in my control to try and get there. But these things out of my control that were, it was starting to rattle me a little bit about me not achieving this, this goal. Um, and it made me start to dislike playing a little bit. Um, it, and then that kind of just allowed me to, to once I kind of took a backward step and um, assess where I was at, I started to realize these things that, um, yeah, chasing that goal is a little bit stupid. <laughs> that's, how, but how, yeah, it's great to step back and reflect on it. And that's really good. But was there a moment? Was there someone you spoke to? Was it, I don't know, did you read anything that would be like, you know what, I do need to take a step back. And I guess reassess my goals, probably reassess my values. Was yeah. there anything that, that stood out? <sighs> Not that I can remember like a, an exact conversation or reading an exact article or anything like that. Although I do learn a lot through those things. Mm. Um, I'm sure they have influenced how I, how I have gone about and how I have learned um, also and influenced my... Um, my mindset towards my own subjective experience but um, a lot of the times I think I had to learn through discovery of actually myself just taking actions and so um, if the action I wasn't doing wasn't working I had to try and change things or if my mindset or approach wasn't working I changed things and so that's when I learned a lot of things about myself and about a lot about footy and myself as a player as a person in my career and yeah, that's, um, that's pretty much how I learnt a lot of the things about me. You talked about stress of performing at a high level and the pressures of, I guess, performing at a high level. Were they more external or were they more internal from yourself? <clears throat> yeah, I think probably internal. When it's, it's the pressure I place upon myself to succeed there. Um, and the metric of success wasn't actually a, a real true indication of performance it was someone else selecting me in the team so i placed this internal stress on myself to do everything i could to do that and then when it wasn't working out it was like oh, i just felt so shit about myself because i wasn't measuring up to that metric of success um yeah i i think a lot of people in rugby league their their stress is internal because they have the same the same attitudes they want to succeed they realize that football is such a short period of time in your life 
and you grow up with these these fantasies, this ideal situation predicament that you really want to achieve. You're so driven to do it. Um, and then when you don't achieve those things, it's like so devastating to people. You see the guys who come out of footy, even early, even when they finish footy, like they've just got, there's like this emptiness and like mm. this feeling of like not enoughness, right? Because they yeah. didn't reach what they thought was the ideal thing. Like, mate, perfect example. Like, yeah. thought like retired at 24, yeah. thought I was going to play until I was 30s. Um, but was not like wasn't the case. Mm. Lucky for me, I like things outside of rugby league. Like yeah. footy's not my whole life. But there are so many boys, our mates, who mm. are going through footy, who come out of footy, and that feeling of yeah, what am I going to do after footy? Like, it's just it's wild, hey. Yeah, yeah. It's there's so many people that once they get to that point, it's just such a real crossroads in their life, and a lot of them go through a crisis yeah a lot of them go through a crisis at upon retirement where they don't get that stimulation anymore like there's nothing that means as much to them anymore as the challenges and the i guess the the importance that they placed on rugby league in their life Mm. so you just mentioned yourself your way of coping and like actually being able to lead a fulfilling life post footy and part of it as well, why you would have been an athlete, is you've got to have things outside of it, mate. hundred percent, even through the journey. you got to. Oh, massive through the journey. Because I've had the same thing, obviously, like you know about my studying yeah. and um, I am have really close friendships and things like that outside of rugby league. And I, I've tried to always never forget where I'm from and my family and things like that. So I have lots of other things going on in my life. And that's just been so important yeah. because... Although making New South Wales at that point in 2020 or 21, for example, was really big to me, if if I felt so shit about myself playing footy at that point in time, I could just go spend time with my mates, yeah. and I'd realize like you know what, like this is this is more important than footy. This is what life's about. It's about enjoying life. It's not about having this stupid metric of like what a good life is about. Yeah, you know, that's what I've like recently started to learn now was that like with footy, wanted to play NRL, played NRL, made the starting side, wanted to stay in the starting side. Even coming out of footy, I had this feeling of, yeah, I guess not quite making it or mm. not quite doing all that I could do. So I was trying to do everything I could outside of it and was still chasing the, the status, was still chasing the money, was still trying to work hard, like doing double sessions like morning and night mm. while trying to figure, figure it out. But what I come to realize is that like that's not what it's about. Like those external... I guess like motivators, that's not it. Like mm. that's not it. And what Ben Crow talks about it a lot, like your intrinsic and extrinsic. And he mm. works a lot with like Steph Gilmore, the surfer, Ash Barty. Yeah. Um, and when there was some there was some interview where they were talking to Ash about like some upcoming like the Australian Open or one of the opens and they were like, Well, what does success look like if you if you win this? Or like do you have much pressure going on mm. with this going on? And she's like that's not my version of success. Mm, like my yeah. version of success is, you know, my friends, my family, you know, meaningful experiences, meaningful relationships. I can't, like you said, you said it perfectly. It's like, I can't control what happens on the court. I can control everything, my inputs, but mm. I can't control the way the ball bounces, how the opposition is going to play. Mm. Um, so I think lately I've sort of been kind of like reflecting a little bit and being like, yeah, my, my values is more like meaningful work meaningful relationship doing stuff like this that you know i love like i love having these mental health conversations even just chatting with mates to be honest like in a room where there's no phone there's no shit it's just like just guys who you like obviously look up to respect or mates who you've played with because it's more likely to have vulnerable conversations with them as well but yeah i love what you said like having something through footy or having something that you're really passionate about fucking goes such a long way yeah yeah, mate, it's it's massive, you know. Like, I think the last few years has really been... <coughs> I mentioned how up until maybe 21 is when I was still chasing it, and then I've kind of, the last few years, I've really sat back and looked at, like, what, what my life's actually about and what I'm trying to achieve mm. by doing these certain things. And it was like, what, well, what's State of Origin actually going to achieve for me as a person? And it's like, well, like, I get to represent my state that I'm passionate about, but it was all personal. It was all like ego driven. Mm. And the more I kind of went into it, it was like, that's not actually going to, I'll feel good for a week, a month. It's not sustainable. 
because I'll just be chasing, oh, I need to play Origin 2. Mm. I need to play Origin 3. Yeah. And it's just going to continue all the way down. So I'm like, yeah, I had to change my metric of success. And I, I went about that through understanding more about what I'm about as a person, what, what I value in life. Like you just mentioned how Ash Barty kind of discusses what, what she values and you have applied the same kind of um, techniques to your life now and understanding your values and pursuing things based off your values and with a real purpose, mm. not just ego driven, but to be something more important, more meaningful than just yourself. Um, so that's kind of how I go about football now. Mm. Um, and it's probably a lot different to how a lot of blokes approach football. Most, most pretty players, yeah, I reckon. I don't think many players are... Like a lot of boys play for their families yeah. to support their family. Yeah. Like a lot of the Polynesian boys will send lots of money back home to their staff. And it's just like, it's really noble what they do. Um, yeah, particularly Caucasian white Australians though, like they're pretty much just playing for themselves. They want glory. Yeah, yeah 100%. <laughs> they want prestige, glory. And that's yeah. what we kind of get brought up in our culture to pursue is like this individual success. Like, no, you want glory and you want money and cars and women and all these other things as well. So you grow up thinking that's what you need. But then, yeah, sometimes it takes a big event, I think. Mm. Like y you got forced into retirement. It wasn't fair what happened. Mm. But like what else can you do? Can't kick stones. Exactly. Like what am I going to do? Kick stones and you know, spiral. Waste, waste the next couple of years drinking, drug. Like that's not going to help me. No, exactly right. You know, it's you've got to accept it, don't you? It's always what's next. And you're always, mate, you're always looking at what's next. Like you're always looking forward. And I want to touch on your psychology degree. I want to touch on what you're doing outside of sport. Mm. But before that, um, I do want to talk about your dad if you're yep. if you're comfortable with yeah, talking about that. I know 100%. I know that you're you've become a lot more open about your dad's story and the relationship you mm. have with your dad. I don't want to put any words in your mouth, but what was it like growing up with your dad and, and what's the story there? Yeah, so um when I was a young kid, I th like my dad is a normal guy, but yeah. um he does have a condition. He's always had major depressive disorder. So um I grew up not knowing that because my parents did quite well to kind of guard me from, and like who, what six year old would know, 100%. you know? So I grew up um, throughout my young childhood, not knowing that and my, like my, I thought my family life was just very normal and it was. Um, the first time that I got exposed to what it was, what my dad was actually going through was I think I maybe would have been 10 years old, I don't know, eight to 10. And um, I was playing a game of cards or something with my dad at, at, the, at the dinner table. And it was in the morning. It was breakfast time or something. And he got a call from his mum. And um, so he's, he's, he's picked up the phone. And she must have said, how are you? And he just screams at the top of his lungs, I wish I was dead. Far out. So that was the first time that... I ever got exposed to it and I had no idea what was happening. I thought something tragic had happened in the family and I started bawling my eyes out crying and I'm at the phone and like I run over, I'm like, what's happened? And then my mum's like, has to go and like, you know, support him. And then she's trying to support me at the same time. It was this crazy traumatic experience. It's one of the most, like one of the most salient things in my memory to this day that I'll remember for the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, so it was obviously a, pretty traumatic thing for a young kid to experience and then ever since that event it was just my whole kind of childhood my my whole adolescence everything in my perspective changed and it was about <coughs> not just trying to live my life like I, I got to learn and understand more about my dad that was part of were you 10 years old when this first happened 10 years like, old. how do you like you don't process how do you process that, that? How do you process that? probably put how, do you in a how do you process that I, I can remember, like, I thought about it all the time. I thought about it all the time yeah. because my I had my mum had to have a conversation with me after that and she had to explain to me about his condition and what was happening. And I, all I can remember when I was a kid, I'm like, why would someone not want to be alive? Yeah. And so then I'd, I'd have these huge, like, deep ruminations at night, like when I was trying to go to sleep and stuff and I'd be thinking about death and all these different, like, weird deep but like 
it's kind of made me the person who I am now because going through that experience at such a, such a young age just changed me and changed my perspective of the world. I've never had a different perspective of the world. I've never had a normal perspective of the world because of that experience that I had. It's just been with me the, my entire life. So, um, yeah, it was. It is. It's just part of my life. It's something that I've grown up with and that I've had to learn to deal with. Um, there's been so many challenges along the way. There's been so many similar events that have occurred like that. There's mm. been worse events that have occurred. Mm. Um, but yeah, this is, it's just a part of my story and my journey. And there's so many similar stories. There's so many similar journeys that happen out there because unfortunately, um, these these issues are so common. Mm. Um, it seems to be increasing. Um, and I'm just so thankful that I get to live the life that I live. And it's a, I'm so grateful not only to be a professional athlete, but just to be happy and healthy mm. and to have people around me who support me and love me. And so um, I think it's helped me enormously just to be a resilient person, to be a grateful person, to approach life um, with a, an attitude of zest and um, embrace um, so I've turned, we spoke earlier about how you got to take a negative situation and look at it as an opportunity for growth. And I guess my whole life is kind of a story of looking at doing that. Were you conscious of that when you were growing up in your teens? Like, look, cause you could have, either, you probably could have gone down two paths, like spiraled and, and ended up drinking and drugs. And I, I'm just assuming, mm. but it's almost like you went the other way. Like you went to play professional sport. You're probably very successful. You're obviously very academic. Mm. Like, were you conscious of that back then? I'm trying to think because I'm imagining there's a lot of people who would be going through a similar situation, right? Like yeah, with, a, yeah. with, with, uh, with an adult or whether it's a parent, whether it's a sibling, whatever it is. Yeah. What's the thought process like when you were, when you were a kid, <clears throat> if you can remember? I think, uh, yeah, so I, because I had to, I was always thinking about it. Like, obviously, I'm, I'm not going to think about some stupid mm. uh, game of footy or like whatever else is happening with my mates when I'm like 10 years old when that's happening, you know? Yeah. So because it was, I was thinking about it all the time, I think I just learned how to deal with it in a really effective way. And like, I would have had help with my, from my mom. Mm. And luckily she was such an amazing person who just devoted, she's devoted her whole life to her family and giving us the best possible life that we could while trying to support her husband who's going through these horrible issues at the same time. Um, so she, the love that she provided, the care, the support would have helped me deal with these things in, in such a way that provided me with a really resilient approach. Mm. And then I've taken that resilient approach and applied it to other things in my life. Um, so then any other adversity that I come across, I don't get picked in Howard Matz when I'm 15 or I've got to lose weight cause I'm too fat at the point or like, that's chump change. What other, that's, yeah. that's, that's small compared nothing. to what, what you've gone through. Right? Nothing, yeah. nothing. So every, I can remember and she was, she was my coach throughout mm. like my life. She would tell me how, <laughs> she tried to tell me how to play footy and stuff, but she would tell me how to respond to these difficult situations as well. Um, and it was always you've got to suck it up, you've got to accept it and then you've got to move forward mm. looking at like how can you change things now to improve things in the future. And so as a 10-year-old kid, when I get exposed to something like that, it's like, well, this is clearly a path that someone can go down if things get bad enough for them. So I was like, what can I do to ensure that that doesn't occur for me? And so... That's been my approach to life. Yeah. And it, it's been ingrained in who I am since that age. It's like, all right, well, if this is actually a realistic way that people can go down a spiral to this point where they no longer want to live, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that doesn't happen. Mm. So that's that's what I've gone about doing. I love that. I love that so much. That yeah. last little bit about going down the path. You, you don't want that to happen to anyone else. Mate, I've... Like we've known each other for a couple of years now, obviously mm. coming to the Parramatta, and you're probably one of my really good friends at the at the Eels. Mm. I had no idea, like I no. I had no and I and I was reflecting on it after we caught up. 
whenever it was and you told me about the story of your dad and you're like, yeah. you didn't know, did you? And I was like, I had no idea. No, I had no goose, I had goosebumps thinking about it now. I felt like, to be honest, I felt like a shit mate. Like I felt like such a shit mate. No, it's not. But, that, but, that's, but that's what it's like. It's like you, you ask, and it mate, happens with footy all the time. Like we guys who you go through, like how much time, like we spend so much time with blokes in the team probably mm. more than what they do with their family and their kids. Like yep. you're with each other all the time, yep. but we don't know these, like these key moments or these things. And I guess you probably don't have to talk about it all the time, but having a safe place where you can talk about these things, mate, what, what was the moment or when did you realize that you wanted to start talking about it? Cause I imagine you probably didn't talk about it a lot mm. growing up. Yeah. Right? No, it was something that I kept very close to my chest as I was growing up. Cause I thought it was, something unique and that other people wouldn't understand and mm. stuff like that the more i've studied the more i've learned uh, read and listened to podcasts and stuff and now nowadays our culture at least is much more open to talking about these things i've realized just how common it is yeah. um but i never spoke about it in a footy context <coughs> until probably last year yeah so you know shit, mate. Like no one, no one really knew. Like I didn't even really tell my close friend. I've been close. I've been best mates with five of my school friends since I was thir- thirteen years old. Since year seven in high school, I wouldn't have started telling them things until I was twenty. That's when they just get drip fed a little bit of information, wow. because when I'm with my friends and when I'm around my teammates and stuff, I'm part of how I live my life is I'm, I'm in the moment. Yeah. That's how you be a happy person. Yeah. You don't like, I don't want to bring things back to these negative things happening in my life. Cause that's just, it is what it is. I'll deal with that when they occur with those things, but you need to live in the moment. You need to embrace what's happening around you and, um, really enjoy the, the things that are occurring. Um, so that was, that's always been my approach. So a lot of people in my life have never really known about it the the time that it changed like i mentioned was last year because when i've mentioned how in the last few years i've tried to live more by my values and more by my purpose and how things have changed about wanting to live a life bigger than me more than an ego driven experience a lot of my purpose now is about trying to help people in similar situations that i might be in or having their own struggles um if i can help them in some way connecting with people whatever it whatever it means i was gonna say what does that look like practically so last year on on the back of a really good season and i'm killing it getting all these and killing it (laughs) (laughs) yeah we're doing well mate we're doing well (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Live in the dream. <laughs> There's a clip. There's a clip. <laughs> Live in the dream. No, so when I'm when I'm going well, and I I didn't intend for this. It was like, it was um so ironic that I was always chasing this ego fueled experience of wanting to play rep footy and have all these things occur. And then once I let it go, that's when I played started playing my best footy. How wild is Cause that? Because I was more relaxed. I was just happy. I was doing things because I enjoyed it and trying to be the best person I could be and all these other things. Yeah. That's when I pl- started playing my best footy. That's when all these things started occurring better in my life. And then that's when all of a sudden media wanted more of a piece of me and I get, started getting more of this attention and stuff like that. And I can remember in the run up to, like the lead up to the finals, to the GF, I'd never been spoken about this much in the media or anything like that. No way. Um, And then I got asked a question in one of these media days about like, what, what's, what's been the change in me and like what influences me and what drives me and all these things. And someone must've touched on like what, what motivated me to start studying psychology and all these other things. And I mentioned my dad and then they asked me more and I, I just went into it a little bit because I was like, well, I can always ask this reporter not to write about it. Um, but I was like, I think now's the time. Now's the time that I can actually start sharing this with the world, with the public. Um, because I'm someone who comes from a position where people look up to them a lot more now. Mm. 
like I felt like I had the influence and the ability to be able to start actually changing things and making a, a difference in the world by sharing my story and by sharing my dad's story. Do you have conversations with your dad? Like, is he, he's obviously comfortable you talking about it. Is that a conversation that you guys have now? <coughs> yeah, so I, I can remember the first time I got asked and I just went into a little bit and, and then I was like, in my head, I, I'm just going to tell him that he's had depression my whole life and this and this and then they kept on asking me and I just went into it a little bit more and more each question yeah. and then I realized I just kind of exposed a whole bunch about him and yeah. like I was telling a whole bo- lot about my childhood and stuff <coughs> not as much as what I am today yeah. but I, I just kind of touched on it a bit for the first time really publicly and, and so I went home and I asked him the the next night or whatever it was and I said oh a reporter asked me about you and I just kind of went into it. I was like is that okay with you if I start sharing about my story and about you i was like i think it would help a lot of people and he said you share everything that you need to do <laughs> Get your bro. so um he's never shied away from what he's had to face and he doesn't hide from his diagnosis or anything like that um so i'm very thankful that he's like it's it's pretty brave it's pretty mate, courageous mate, for someone to, to do that you both your mum and dad sound like two incredible people Mm. how how is the relationship with your dad now yeah it's still um it's still very challenging mate it still really is um the older i get the the more i learn about it um the more i immerse myself in psychology uh the more i realize kind of like what i can do to help uh a lot of the time it just means being someone to listen to uh, to listen to what he has to say validating his emotions because everyone goes through their own struggles everyone has different experiences and reactions and we're all human at the end of the day and just because one person has a diagnosis of depression doesn't make them any different from anyone else Mm. they just have a different emotional experience to certain things mate that's that's the whole reason for these conversations right like yeah. conversations with yourself who you know best player in in Parramatta, right like one mm. like one of the influential players in the nrl you got young kids and people looking at you for inspiration they were like well if you can be seen having these conversations well then so can i and it's validating what they're going through as well exactly. which is which is insane and i know you're about to have a whole bunch of conversations going forward which mm. is so cool uh, I mm-hmm. do want to touch on psych- psychology, mate. We, we caught up a couple of weeks ago and, mate, you're the reason why I'm doing my graduate diploma in psychology because <laughs> I, I, was, I was thinking about how to navigate it because same with you, mate. I've been very intrigued about mental health forever. Like, I've been mm. doing stuff with Movember for the last eight years. Yeah. Like, I want to do a deep dive into it and I wasn't sure how to navigate it and you, and you were telling me about, you know, you've done your previous degree. You can yep. do a postgraduate if you've already done yep. um, already done a bachelor's, which is, which is really cool. And uh, after that, I've, started talking to a lot of crew who are psychologists who are studying psychology and just having like just really authentic conversation and they said when you first get into it the the chat is mainly around well you're getting into it to help yourself or to help people around you yeah is that for you is it one or the other is it a bit of both yeah it was definitely a bit of both i think um well i was always interested in my dad and things that were occurring with him and to help out other people in similar situations and stuff. That's been more so the last few years. Mm. But um, the reason why I kind of first started getting interested in in psychology and about studying it in the first place was um, probably some of the experiences that I've been through in in rugby league Mm. personally and the challenges that I've been through and the things that have I noticed that each step of the way, each time I, I went through something bad, some negative experience, um, that it wasn't my physical approach to the game. It wasn't my skill level that changed. It was my attitude or my approach mentally. So that was kind of what intrigued me mm. um, massively was how it applied to rugby league. Um, so in in a way, I'm enormously thankful. I'm, I'm so enormously thankful to be a rugby league player in sport. And one of the reasons is because of the amount of adversity it provides you and the amount, <laughs> the amount of growth that I've experienced through that yeah. and 
how much light it's shed on me as a person for me to be able to then understand who I am and go out and then now understanding what I'm about and what passions I have, I've gone off and studied those and it's just set up this pathway for me to be able to continue doing what I love, not just while I'm playing football, but then beyond that. There's so many crazy traits that you get out of pro- playing professional sport, right? <clears throat> like we've, we've talked about Insane. learning how to have hard conversations, like we're having, <laughs> we're, like having hard conversations every week. Like I, I Every Monday morning. Every yeah. Monday morning, every weekend, <laughs> half time of a game, after the game, preview, just being scared of coming in Monday morning. Like I remember when I was at Bronx um, in the under 20s, like under 20s, pro, we'd play on a Friday night and then we'd come in Monday afternoon for review. And there would just be like, you know, the list, the list of names, it'd be like Keegan, what the air for, like you dumb, whatever it is like, and you just, and you see a name and you just, you just, you get a little bit of anxiety coming through, oh, but that little makes, bit, yeah, I hate, <laughs> but it makes, I don't know, it kind of makes, I guess, I'm, and obviously I'm not, a, I'm not endorsing that at all. Like I'm, I'm, I don't have an opinion on that, but it does make you, it does make you tough. Right. And even now taking that into the real world. I can have conversations <laughs> with mates. I can have conversations with employers, with bosses. And to be honest, it doesn't really phase me that much, to be honest. Well, it's probably nothing like what you've, <laughs> the amount of adversity or angst that you've had to experience before the difficulties of, of conversations that you've experienced previously. Yeah. Um, what you're just saying reminds me of a book I've read called The Obstacle is the Way. Yeah. Um, I think it's Ryan Holiday is mm. the author. Um, but it's all about leaning into discomfort mm. and if that's if ever uh, i've read a book that applies to the journey of playing rugby <laughs> league <laughs> the obstacle is the way is a perfect description of a perfect instructional on how to deal with it mm. you've got to lean into those experiences and you have to learn how to reframe those things in a positive way mm. and uh take the challenge on board and then, like you said, you've grown from it enormously. I've grown from it enormously. Mm. So, so many of our teammates and other other, other footy players have grown from it massively. W- what's probably one other or two more other big traits that you've gotten from rugby league? Is it, is it resilience? Is it hard work? Is it we obviously touch on having hard conversations, network? Like what? Are, what's probably the biggest thing that you've got from rugby league that you're thinking about taking into? or that you'll naturally take into life after footy? I think without rugby league, I wouldn't be the confident person that I am today. Mm. So I think it's just like um, self the self-esteem, the confidence it's given me. Because I think it's kind of like the, the challenges that I've overcome in like, yeah, resilience is a massive thing. But then the, the, the product of that is you feel invincible. Right. <laughs> I yeah. feel like I can do anything, yeah, honestly, yeah. almost. It's a, I'm like, I've been through so much shit just through my profession alone. Yeah. On top of that, the things that I've been through personally, and I'm like, you know what? My self-esteem's up here. Yeah. <laughs> there's no, there's no doubt. It. Like, that's probably one massive thing. And if you feel confident in yourself, if you have high self-esteem, you're not worried about what other people think. You're not worried about failure. <clears throat> You can, you can really go out there and do what you want to do in life. Mm. So I owe that enormously to rugby league. I'm trying to think what a second one would be. I think just uh, friendship, camaraderie, yeah. the value of, of that. And a lot of the time in footy, camaraderie looks very different <laughs> <laughs> imagine taking someone from like an average joe into the dressing shirts <laughs> like, i remember when you go into a workplace i was like this is you can't say these types of things you <laughs> no can't way. do these types of things <laughs> no way i remember uh, someone in one of the sheds i think we we're at bronx or titans like brought a snake like brought an actual snake into the sheds like the boys are showering nude and they're up in the corner <laughs> they're up in the corner like freaking out i think it was josh mcguire oh. on milford i think there's a clip of it somewhere or maybe it was lexi i can't remember what it was so even but even the cool conversations snake. like you're pretty much like half belittling or like taking the piss out of one of the boys but it's kind of a sign of affection sometimes yeah yeah and <sighs> that's just like having a bit of fun in the change rooms yeah in when you do things like review or when you're playing on the field 
like, you might mess up. Some teammates, the way that they respond to that yeah. is they just come over and spray the fuck out of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, like, that camaraderie is them somewhat looking after you. Because yeah. they realize, like, they're pulling your, your head in to go, what you just did is not good enough for the team. And, like, it's not good enough for yourself either. Mm. It's not good enough for me. It's not good enough for anyone. So, they're looking after you. Um, they're looking after the, everyone else in the process too. So, it's about... That part of footy is about making sacrifices for something bigger than you. Mm. And putting your ego aside for the benefit of the team. So, that level of camaraderie... Um, that's that's what I really enjoy about footy. Mate, I love that. Me mm. too. Um, just to finish up, what does what does life look like after footy? Have you had any thoughts? Obviously, you you finished just about to finish the psych diploma. Is I finished the psych diploma. What's next? Um, I can't, I'm currently studying masters of positive psychology. Um, that's really good. That that's just um, perfectly applicable to yeah. who I am as a person and what I'm trying to what I'm passionate about. Um, it's all about flourishing. It's all about being the best person and the best, living the best life that you can. Third degree, <laughs> onto the third. Third. <laughs> stay third humble. Degree. Stay humble. Put his paper at all too. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> One benefit of rugby league again. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Um, but do you know where you want to see end up? Do you want to work with athletes? Do you want to work with people? You want to stay in the sporting world? Like, what's mm. do you, do you have a thought? And it's okay if you don't. But have yeah. you had any thoughts? No, I for sure. I've thought about it in depth. And like that's been part of like guiding me towards what I want to do and what I want to study and stuff is actually thinking about who I am and what I want to do um, beyond football because I, I have a long longer plan than that. I look further ahead. Um, and so, to be honest, I see myself coaching in some capacity because mm. I feel like understanding what my strengths are as a person and as a player, the skills that I provide. I think that that's probably going to be um, the best way that I can assist other people, help other people be the best person and deal with their own struggles moving forward um, in the best possible way. So that's probably uh, what I see myself moving into post-footy. I don't know whether it will be as a head coach, as a... I'm very passionate, obviously, about mental health, mental skills, things like that. You know, that's what psychology is all about so um if i could get into that space as a coach of of i'm obviously really passionate about sport too and such a unique experience you pretty much need to be an athlete if you're going to go into the athlete space 100%. otherwise you're not going to be accepted you don't know you won't be relatable you're not going to be it. you yeah. just don't know what the experience is like until you've been a part of it so i think i can really help out other athletes in the future after finishing my degree and getting some more years of experience in um so yeah i see myself definitely working with sport coaching capacity um i'm open to other avenues as well uh, other work in terms of like i understand there's a massive pathway for mental skills coaches well-being coaches in corporate areas and personal coaching things like that too so um yeah definitely not definitely open-minded I would have loved to have someone like that when I was like 20 years old or 18 years old because mm. when I was going through probably similar to yourself, I had no idea what I was doing. I was young, aggressive, just just so dumb, just an, just an idiot. And I would love to have someone just pull me aside and help me work through the stuff. I was talking to one of the head psychologists, one of the best psychologists in Melbourne who, mm. who works with one of the AFL clubs. And the way she describes it, yeah. If you if you don't get rugby, if you don't get sport, you're not going to be relatable in no. the team. Even just navigating through the hierarchy mm. of of, yeah. of of a sporting <laughs> environment, yeah. you know this this lady is is incredible, and I love where her head's at. But she's like, I'm qualified, more qualified than everyone in this organization, but purely because you've got a head coach or you've got not even, and that might not even be in that scenario, but in past scenarios, if you've got someone who you know has played the game and they make all the calls, like if, and if you're not aligned, then, you know, you're not going to be you're on the same level, which is last. crazy. You're not going to last. You're, last. you're going to be an outcast. Especially if, if the boys, like if the boys don't, you know, rate you, if they don't get on with you, boys <laughs> or girls, you know. But yeah. I'm, we're talking obviously from a male point of view. Mm -hmm. But they're like, yeah, if you're, you're probably not going to last. From from her perspective, if she came in and starts 
talking down on people in a condescending way. Like, I'm more educated than anyone else in this 100%. building. They're just going to go, get the fuck out. 100%. But she doesn't, she doesn't do yeah, that. She, yeah. she, she, relates, understands. she relates to the players. Like, she, she's got so much love from the players. Mm. Like, and I'm not going to, I'm obviously not going to name her on this podcast. We'll talk about, we'll talk yeah. afterwards. But yeah, she she's, um, really but she's, in, she's incredible. Like, and she's, she's doing stuff that other sporting codes aren't doing in Australia. Yeah. You know, you've got crew over in the States, you've got crew over in, in the UK who have two, three psychologists like traveling with the team. Mm, yeah. Where's that in Australia? It's not there yet. So that's why I think there's such a, a <clears throat> huge growth in terms of, you know, psych, positive psychology, yeah. mindset, coaching, coaching, mm. the whole thing. It's so cool because I would have loved to have that when we were younger. Yeah, yeah. Well, part of the reason why I see myself doing that is because Firstly, there is a gap in the market. Mm. So I can see myself like, all right, that's, I can easily fill that role yeah. because of my education and my personal experience. But also because you just said you wish you had it as a 20-year-old. Mm. I know from my own journey, my own experiences, the things I've been through, mate, it would have just saved me so much time and effort and all this struggle if I had someone there yeah. to kind of help guide me and be a mentor along the way to deal with these personal issues that I was having, um, interpersonal issues that I was having with, with people, and how to fix my mental approach. Because I had to discover it myself. Oh, 100%. And I could have easily just fallen off the wagon like three times or something throughout my career. And my career could have been lost. Yeah. All these opportunities that I've had, all these experiences that I've been through and learnt, learnt from, I could have never gone through any of those because... I couldn't get over the fact that this person treated me the way that I didn't think was fair at the time, like mm. something so immature like that. So I can see the ability for me to step into a position like that, but then also the value it provides for young Keegan, who Graves and Sean Lance. Brother, mate, yeah. thank you. Thanks so much for <laughs> jumping. Mate, thanks so much for being, just for being vulnerable and just mm. for being open and honest and, you know, obviously it's easy because we're, we're mates and, you know, we've, we've yeah, been through a bit yeah. together now, but mate, was there anything that we haven't touched on today that, y that you'd like to touch on? <sighs> I don't think so, mate. Brother, we I think we, everything's... We, we smashed through the hour. Yeah. yeah. Is that an hour? Mate, that was a... Well, I think we're just done. Time flies hour. when I'm talking about myself, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just killing it on the field. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> talking about myself killing it. <laughs> But no, mate, that's what mate, I love these conversations. Like, put the phone down, mate. We're, we've just flown through an hour, but yeah. um, I love I love these conversations so much. But, Brett, mate, thank, thanks again for jumping on. Like, I'm, no worries, mate. You, mate no I'm, worries. I'm really excited to see what the next couple of years. Well, I'm more excited to see you after football because mm. I think you're gonna I think you're gonna make the transition very smoothly and, yeah. and very swiftly. Yeah, I think your your podcast on has been something really good, something really refreshing to see a former athlete get into something like this. Um, when, as we spoke about, a lot of people go down the opposite way and mm. the way that you've approached retirement and the things you've done since have been something that um, a lot of other athletes can look look up to and use as a guide towards, like, that's the right way to do it. And I think this podcast is a, a great idea. And, like, when you told me the idea about it, I was like, yeah, that's mad. Yeah. Um, I do my own podcast and the Paradise one. And so a lot of the conversations I've started having have been – a lot about well-being or mental mm. health or other struggles that people have gone through. So I think having a structured podcast to make this a uh, <coughs> a real mainstream conversation, get things out there for people to be vulnerable with, and for other people to understand that mm. it's normal. Like, like hats off to you, man. And I think it's it's something really good and um, something that this the sporting world in Australia needs. You're the best. Thank you, bro. No worries, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.